So there's this ancient Jewish Christian interpretation of Isaiah 9 that to this day is taught by many, and it's known as a double prophecy. That is, the prophet Isaiah was originally referring to someone else, in this case, King Hezekiah. Also, the prophecy has its final fulfillment in the Messiah, Jesus. For example, the NRSV Bible study argues that we may see in this passage what they call a prophetic perspective, that is with reference both to Hezekiah and then to Jesus the Messiah, where God designates human agents whom he empowers and authorizes in the public process of history. Such human agents designated by Yahweh turn the public reality of politics and economics toward the will of Yahweh. I obviously agree with that last statement regarding the use by God of human agents in order not only to proclaim, but ultimately to bring about his kingdom on earth. But the context of Isaiah 9 shows that the central figure here cannot be anyone else but the Messiah, the promised one. Now, the NRSV Bible study actually makes this case, thus undermining their double prophecy teaching. For example, they go on to say that verses 2 to 5, we see a radical transformation that is about to happen from darkness to light, from sadness to joy, from oppression to freedom, from war to peace. Golden Gay, in his book Theology of Isaiah, notes that the darkness is a figure for a situation where one does not understand what is going on, for an experience of trouble, for deception and plotting, and for death itself. A tomb is a dark place. It thus suggests a realm from which Yahweh is absent or in which he is inactive. Light is a figure for a situation where one can see and understand, for a place where one doesn't mind being seen, for an experience of deliverance and blessing, for a realm where Yahweh is present and active. Now back to the NRSV Bible study, they go on to say that verse 6 talks about the reason for this newness is the birth of a child, that is, a messianic son. They go on to say that the four titles at the end of verse 6, made familiar to us through Handel's Messiah, are characteristic royal titles that would have been used in a coronation ceremony. They are not unlike the elaborate titles of imperial majesty assigned to Queen Victoria, for example, in the high days of the British Empire. So we have verse 7. This title anticipates the expansion of the new king's kingdom, which will be marked by justice and righteousness, a governance accomplished by God's own will. Hence, the politically Jewish popular shout of approval made the zeal of Yahweh do this. So here in the opening of the chapter, the darkness obviously to this day has not been lifted. The earth to this day has not been filled with the knowledge of the light of God, as other prophets like Habakkuk 2.14 goes on to say. As a matter of fact, after Hezekiah's death, Israel was taken captive for 70 years in Babylon, and Israel ever since has suffered its fair share of persecutions, holocausts, and to this day, no peace in the Middle East. So verse 6, to us a child is born, but at this stage of the story, Hezekiah was himself already 40 years old. Verse 7, a great and peaceful Davidic rule will be forever. In other words, his government rule will be great and peace will reign over David's throne and kingdom forever. If you compare this to the Greek translation of Isaiah 9, where it says of his great beginning or rule and his peace, there is no boundary, no border. It's worldwide, in other words. But in contrast, God cursed Hezekiah. According to Isaiah 39, his bloodline and kingdom itself were cursed. And here's another good note from the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary on the word peace, which denotes more than just a lack of war. It encompasses well-being, safety, and plenty, along with good relationships with one's brother, neighbor, and God. 
It's a longed for end of one's life as well as an anticipated goal of Israel's settlement of the land after years of wandering. And here's a good paraphrase slash translation by the New Living Translation on Leviticus 26.6. I will give you peace in the land and you will be able to sleep with no cause for fear. I will rid the land of wild animals and keep your enemies out of your land. And then we have the wider context. For example, Isaiah goes on to say in chapter 11 that this child will be called the shoot, a branch, and is obviously a future king of the Davidic line who will fulfill the prophecy in a way that no other king, including Hezekiah, will not. Lastly, note the clear parallels between Isaiah 9 and, for example, Luke 1, recording the coming into existence of the Son of God. Isaiah 9.1, in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations, says Isaiah about this child to be born. Luke 1.26, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Isaiah 9.2, the people will walk in darkness, will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And then Luke 1, 78, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Isaiah 9, 7, according to the Greek translation, his government shall be great. Luke 1, 32, he will be great. Isaiah 9, 7, the latter part of the verse, where this child will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Luke 1, 32, the latter part of the verse, the Lord God will give him, that is the Son of God, Jesus, the throne of his father, David. Luke 1, 33, and he, Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. 